I applaud each and all of you marathon runners, for you have made it through the full course. Many, if not most of you, were here, if not from the very first session at 7 a.m. on Monday. Many of you were here for special private sessions over the weekend. You've made it through 160 separate sessions, 200 of them if you've been attending all the private ones. You've made it through, by this point, close to 654 panelists. And as we all know in marathon running, the sweetest moment is crossing the finish line. And here, you know it's all been worthwhile, and we have saved a great finish for last. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce a wonderful, eclectic panel on leadership, led by somebody who, through his example, his thoughts, uh, his actions, uh, has provided leadership in so many areas uh, throughout the country and around the world, the chairman of the Milken Institute, Mike Milken. So I'd like to first start with leadership. And you maybe didn't notice it, uh, but this year we had almost 1,000 women join us at the Global Conference over the last few days. And there is particularly one individual who made that happen. Now, when I think back to starting my own department uh, in 1970, as I went to New York, 60% of my professionals were women and didn't really think about it too much. But my wife reminds me every night how many women speakers, how many women came to the conference. And I think we can see in countries, particularly like Israel, how enormous productivity changes. And uh, the former first lady of the UK told us, you know, that it, you invest a dollar in a woman, 90% of it gets effectively spent. You invest a dollar in a man, 30% gets effectively spent. <laughs> so there's one individual that made it happen. I'd like uh, her to stand, uh, Nancy Orez. Nancy, if you're here, could you please stand so we could thank you for what you've done in the last week. So they even invited me to speak last night over at the pavilion. So the scene, there's a battle during the Hundred Year War. Henry's army crossed the English Channel. Half the army is lost during the siege. He's down to 5,000 troops. They're exhausted, they're suffering from disease, and they're concerned. And there's a great deal of discussion about maybe they should defect. And who is this crazy person that's leading them? The French force was four to five to one. They were fearful of this battle. One of the greatest speeches ever written by an unknown writer by the name of William Shakespeare. St. Christmas Day speech. Let's take a look at that speech. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand at tiptoe when this day is named and arouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly, on the vigil, feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispin's. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in their mouths as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. 
but we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks that thought with us upon St. Crespin's Day. Well, leadership. It turned the tide of the battle. Casualties, French casualties, 15 to 1 to the British that day, rallying his troops and changed in many ways the history. Well, this is our final session. Unless you're coming to healthy aging tomorrow, uh, this is my sixth day, and for many of you, you're sixth or fifth or fourth. 650 panelists, 11 different tracks. We started in the morning on Monday, focused on so many things, one of them prevention and wellness. And we talked to Troy Brennan about leadership at CVS. The leadership at CVS Caremont that made the decision to stop selling cigarettes. Two and a half billion dollars potential hit to their top line. But the feeling was that they could not continue to sell cigarettes and still stand for health and other things that the company wanted to stand for. We're culminating today with three visionary leaders who've all made certain decisions in their life at some point, took a risk, took a chance, that not only changed their life, but changed the life for everyone they're associated with. And so today we're gonna try to focus on that topic. And I'd like to start with an individual that we refer to as both governor and president and maybe secretary, Janet, all in one. Um, a governor of Arizona, a head of Homeland Security and making 300 million people in the United States feel safe and today leading probably the greatest university system in the world, University of California system. Janet, what made you decide to take that job as the president of the University of California and what risks did you think you were taking in making that decision? You know, after spending time in elective office uh, in, in, as a member of the president's cabinet, and when you're at Homeland Security, it's a, it's a very big, complex job. Uh, it's the third largest department of the federal government. It's a lot of defense. It's protecting the country. It's a lot of work that nobody ever really sees. And in fact, you, you really want to be the dog that doesn't bark most of the time. Because if it's barking, something went wrong. Uh, and the chance to flip from that to going on offense. And when I thought about it, when this opportunity arose, the chance to lead the education of the next generation of Californians, uh, the chance to help support a research enterprise that is the most uh, robust of any research enterprise in the United States, that's going on offense. Uh, and there's a risk of, uh, as in all big decisions, there's a risk of failure. Um, the greater risk is not taking any risk at all. Uh, it's easy to sit back and say, oh, I'm done, I've finished my career. Uh, I'm, I think I will be a consultant. Um, I can do that. Um, but uh, with great challenge, and challenge can be equated with risk, comes great possibility of reward. And that's the work I'm engaged in now. It's fabulous. Well, let's take a look at a short video clip of Janet as she led Arizona with at the time, six million residents, obviously responsible to make sure no one was wanting to know her phone number as the head of Homeland Security, telling us that everything was safe. Responsible today for 235,000 students uh, from that standpoint. Let's take a look at that clip. 
I think uh, one piece of advice would be uh, go for it and take some risk. Uh, you can always keep doing what you're doing. Uh, but if you never test yourself and you never take a risk uh, jumping from uh, a, a very good law firm partnership to being a federal prosecutor, that was a risk. Jumping from that to actually running for office, that was a risk. Then running again for office, that was an even bigger risk, a bigger office, a bigger uh, challenge. Uh, leaving a very comfortable uh, existence in one state to come to Washington, D.C. And, and work in a new department with, with you know, lots of responsibility and you know, all that that entails, also a bigger risk. But in the end, uh, it, it allows you to, by taking those risks, that's, that's really how you can exercise leadership. He walked into my office in the late 1970s and asked me, could I get him a drink? I was wearing jeans and, and a mattress shirt, and he was waiting to see uh, me. But he didn't know it was me. I wasn't in a suit or anything. And um, that has led to a friendship of 35 years. And one of the things, as, as a person that had the honor of financing companies, a chance to see an individual with a vision far greater and the ability to lead far greater than most people uh, that have ever lived. And so, Steve, let's take a look at a short clip of you on the subject of leadership. We live in a world today where everything the, the, between the Internet, Twittering and Facebook and all the rest, everything has become so important about words. What you say, how good you say it, how good you look. Rhetoric has become almost a religion. In politics, it's the spin. Somehow, it seems to me, what has been lost or at least put in the back seat is what you do. And to me, leadership is about what you do. Well, Steve, <laughs> thank you for joining us, and that was a pretty short synopsis, but not too many people are capable of doing what you've done. Anon, let all men, however, however grateful here in this Beverly gathered, though frozen be, <laughs> be reminded that ski season is not over. <laughs> <laughs> nice and chilly in here. No? <laughs> I couldn't resist. Henry V carried me away. <laughs> There's the fact of leadership, and then there's the art of leadership, I guess, for lack of a better term. The fact of leadership, the ability to make one or more persons by coercion or more gently persuasion perform as the leader wishes. In the military, and in many cases, raw authority makes people behave in a way or more ambitiously think in a way that someone wants them to. The art of leadership, it would seem to me, and to the extent that we have any sense of the art of leadership, is to persuade people to behave in a certain way. First of all, because what you're asking to do makes sense and seems right to them, but ultimately the greatest single point of leverage or force available in human nature and human psychology is to identify the goal that you as a leader or the method of behavior that you're advocating somehow be identified with an elevated sense of self-esteem for the people you are leading. When people feel good about themselves because of what you're asking them to do or with the activity in which they're engaged, then, in my view, you've harnessed the ultimate energy available. And the definition of a leader is someone who not using raw authority, but suasion in that matter. That's what, that's what I would aspire to uh, when I'm thinking clearly on the subject. So, Steve, it's the late 1980s. 
you're building a hotel called the Mirage that's going to revolutionize hotels as we know. Central elevator banks, wings coming off that elevator banks, central kitchens in the back for efficiency. The outside, they look like a French or an Italian or a Japanese restaurant in the back. Business Week, of course, writes, it looks like snake eyes for Steve Wynn. Nice warm piece. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks before we open. You're going to have six to 8,000 employees. You've been building this hotel for a few years and planning it for more. You left nothing to chance. You built a warehouse that people could go sleep in the rooms so you could see how they were. It's two to three days before opening. You can build a structure, but the structure is only as good as the people that work in it. What did you tell your employees, many of which are relatively low wage? What did you tell them? How did you interact? How did you get them prepared? Bob Daly and Terry Semble came to that session. Very important moment. Training is finished. The building is done. The public has not received it yet. It's been a campus for two weeks. All the people that have come to work have probably survived at the rate of one out of every 10 our screening method for applications and interviews. They're all excited because they have new beginnings. Everybody in life, all of us love new beginnings. And they have not yet decided that their supervisor is a damn fool. <laughs> it's too soon for that. <laughs> it takes at least two weeks for that to happen. <laughs> it's new beginnings and everybody is full of it. The building is bright and shiny. The carpets are, haven't been walked on yet. And there they are. And as a chairman, it is probably the single greatest moment of leverage I'll ever get in the life of that enterprise. And there they are. So I put on Gracie Slick in the Jefferson airplane that says nothing's gonna stop us now. Get the music going, everybody's blood is up. And I look at them and I say, I know what you want. You wanna make more money? You, so do I. You wanna have a better life? Who doesn't? And maybe, just maybe, here you will find fulfillment and happiness. Believe me, I want what you want. But only people make people happy, and you've got to take responsibility for these customers. The person next to you is not going to do it. You want a better life? It's in your grasp. And I'll make a deal with you. I'll take care of the capital and the money part. You take care of the customers. It's that simple, Mike. I'm trying to come on to them so that they will take responsibility and maybe, just maybe, find what it is they're after in life, which is to be, feel good about yourself and fulfilled on the job. It doesn't come very often to all of us to have such a wonderful experience in our work. I think probably for the people who have come to this conference, successful, intellectually curious, bright and shiny as you all are, you've found that moment. But think about the people that work for you not often the case for them. If you can help them find that, then you're a damn good leader. And you can feel good about yourself when you look in the mirror. Now, Steve, I was there with the opening of the win. Mm -hmm. Eight to 10,000 employees. And I remember you telling them that we're going to make mistakes. Sure okay, about. and what did you tell them to talk about with the customer when there is a mistake? That's our point. First thing you've got to do is give up the illusion, the fiction of infallibility. It causes more trouble in politics, especially Janet, that causes a cover-up. We give that up. We're going to have bad days. We're going to make mistakes. But at the moment of failure in any organization, that is also the maximum moment for the expression of character and the core value of that culture. That's the moment when you can really score. When people are in extremis, when something hasn't gone right, that's when we get to define ourselves ultimately because we come to the rescue. People don't expect a lot. They think they're gonna, it's gonna be everybody for themselves. And then all of a sudden somebody steps up and makes it all better. And that person saves all the rest of us. I wish that lesson went to the government more often. <laughs> so, 
What did you say? What did Janet so say? We should talk. <laughs> so it's the 1970s, and we're the largest trader of securities of companies in the gaming industry, but my firm does not want to allow me to uh, do any underwritings, etc. And I tell Steve that he's going to get on the white stallion and ride in to New York City. And we're going to convince them that this industry isn't run out uh, of some monster location here. And it's really an industry of the future, etc. And I, of course, I did tell Steve, get some shoes with tie laces, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, he did too. <laughs> <laughs> but what's so amazing is a decade or so later, Fortune magazine rated Steve's firm the second most admired firm in the world. And it was the most admired firm, and it scored the highest of any company in the world on service, and that expectation of what you were expecting was always succeeded. Howard, we've been together for more than 30 years, and here's a look at some of Howard and, and, and my videos together and discussions, particularly of, his, of some of the books he's written and, and the memos he's written that have changed the world in so many ways, Howard Marks. We have to understand that in large part, outcomes will be governed by luck and randomness. But people believe that it's their job to know what the future holds that you can know what the future holds, that they do know what you future or if they don't know what the future holds, that they have to act like they do, because if they admit they don't, they'll get bounced. But there's almost nothing in the world which is, which is determined. Everything is uncertain. Uh, Mark Twain said, it's not what you don't know that gets you killed, it's what you know for certain that just ain't true. <laughs> <laughs> so how are we've spent, you know, many years trying to convince people with self-discovery of what they know might not be true, I think, from that standpoint. You've written a lot about luck and being there. I think it might be useful, you know, for the audience to look at those different points in your career. We had a decision as to what you're going to do, whether you're going to go on this path or another path. And you know, how you made those decisions and, and what was based on and, and how today you lead a large public company that's responsible for managing, you know, more 75 billion or more of other people's money uh, from that desk at Citibank yeah. when we first met. Well, I think, I think an example, Mike, is back in 78, which is when we first met in November of 78. Um, I had been the director of research at Citibank. I, had a, I was 29 when I got that job. I had a big budget and a big staff and, and a lot of responsibility. And I was all, on all the key committees at the bank and I was, uh, it was the most unhappy period of my life. My job was to know two sentences on 400 companies and, and nothing could be less satisfying. And uh, I got a call uh, and they said, there's some guy out in California named Milken or something who deals with high yield bonds. Can you figure out what that is? Because one of the clients had asked for a portfolio. So I could have tried to cling to that bureaucratically important uh, job, but instead I, I uh, looked into what uh, high yield bonds were and I thought they were intriguing and you came and gave me what we would politely call a, a sales pitch. And, uh, and, and I went that way. So I went from a, having... Was that a sales picture or enlightenment? That was enlightenment. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you called it. Uh, and, um, and, and I went to having uh, no employees and no budget and, um, and to do something that was very interesting intellectually and, um, and uh, very rewarding. And, and I was never more excited uh, than by my new job. Um, and I think that... You know, that was, a, that was obviously a, a big uh, fork in the road for my life. And uh, one of the things that uh, made, me, made it possible to take what seemed in the short run the less um, prestigious and the less remunerative uh, path was the fact that 
I, I faced the music uh, that I didn't really believe in what I had been doing. Um, you know, as director of research, uh, trying to lead an organization, trying to pick the best stocks. Uh, you know, I'd gone to the University of Chicago. I'd learned something about something called the inefficient market. And I believed that there are efficient markets, and I concluded that the big stock market was one of them. And what I said in 78 to myself, to my bosses, is I don't want to spend the rest of my life choosing between Merck and Lilly. Uh, among other things, I, can't, I think it can't be done. So I opted for something that, that, that fit with my in intellectual principles and, uh, and turned out uh, extremely well. Um, and uh, I think that uh, I, I've never regretted it. The book, Most Important Things, Howard. Yes. You know, a lot of us think, well, okay, we're going to write a book someday. We're going to sit down and write a book. But very few people ever have the discipline to do that because they're so busy doing that they never really stop and do that. Uh, I, I think, you know, there's so many unusual things in that book, but I think one of the things that people don't really understand when you say second-level thinking, yeah. why, why don't you spend a minute talking about what is second-level thinking? Well, you know, if you think like everybody else, you're going to perform like everybody else. The, the goal in investment management is to, f to outperform the others, but clearly in order to do so, you have to think better and different, and, uh, and you have to deviate. Now, of course, uh, the efficient market uh, hypothesis says that uh, most of the information is incorporated in the market already, and the person who deviates from the consensus is usually wrong. So, you, you know, you can't deviate for the, sense of de for the sake of deviating, but I think by the same token, you know, you must uh, have a variant perception, and it's from that that uh, outperformance comes. And you have to do it for good reason. You know, the, the first level thinker says it's a great company, you should buy it. And the second level thinker says it's a great company, but it's not as great as everybody else thinks, you should sell it. And uh, if, if you can do the latter and uh, do it correctly, uh, really that's the route to outperformance. And uh, I think that's true in every business, uh, is uh, not following the crowd, variant perception, um, uh, uh, but knowing when, you know, you can't have a, you can't have a variant perception about every decision, um, and and have it be right. Uh, I, as I said before, you can't have a variant perception about the difference between Merck and Lilly, and be consistently right. Uh, but when you find a, a commonly held belief which you identify as being wrong, and you know why you think it's wrong, and you have conviction. Uh, then there's no better way uh, to achieve success. So let's take a look at a point in our country's history where we're kind of looking for leadership. For America to bounce back from the blow, it has to overcome wounded national pride. In Washington, there's more concern than ever than the city has known since Pearl Harbor. People are scared and many have panic reactions. They are searching for someone and someone, something and someone to blame. There's a sudden crisis of confidence forcing the United States to change its priorities. Now, we're not talking about 9-11. This was the headlines in the newspapers in 1957 when Sputnik went up. Mm. And as we think back of that period of time that all of us remember in some way, the response ultimately of the President of the United States was we choose to go to the moon in this decade not because it's easy, but because it's hard, because the challenge is one we're willing to accept and one we are unwilling to postpone and one which we intend to win. So the concern about leadership in science, and as you all know, less than a decade later, we heard the eagle has landed. Janet, when you were a head of Homeland Security, were there particular issues where you sat around and said, okay, what is the message we're gonna to deliver to the American people? How are we gonna deal with this issue 
And what are the pluses and the minuses of different approaches on that? Well, let me uh, go back. Actually, something uh, that Steve said I thought was right on, which is uh, if you try to say that everything's 100% great and nothing bad's going to happen and that you are infallible, that to me shows a great side of insecurity and people smell that very quickly. Um, I think what people want to hear uh, is kind of a, a layout about what the problem is and what you're doing to fix it or to solve it. Uh, and we had any number of those uh, and, and some of them were man, uh, man caused terrorist type incidents, uh, Boston Marathon bombing, we just had the one year anniversary. Uh, uh, all the way to Mother Nature uh, wrecking havoc. Um, and we didn't, I, w I will tell you, my, we didn't spend a lot of time sitting around thinking about how we were going to spin things. But what we did think about was what is the best way to give people information they need so they know we're working to fix a problem and they are empowered and know what they need to do. And where that is most acute is when you're right in the, the immediate aftermath of, of a disaster, a series of tornadoes um, such as we just experienced in Arkansas this week. We had 350 um, uh, federally declared major disasters when I was the secretary. Um, I will tell you, experience matters, and I was much better at handling them and communicating with people about them uh, uh, at the end than I was at the beginning. I think, uh, have you left that chair as the head of Homeland Security today? Every time there's a catastrophe, do you rush and start thinking about what you would do? Uh, no, but I, there are moments when I, and I think to myself, I know what the current secretary is probably thinking about today. Um, you know, what's that line from Camelot? I know what the king is doing tonight. Uh, or I wonder what the king is doing tonight. Well, you wonder. And you know it. You, you've been there. You, you know it. Uh, and I'm glad I'm focused on California. Okay. You know, there's a number of things. <laughs> Howard, in some of his books, focuses on the concept of luck and what role luck plays. Let's take a look at how some people have looked at that rule of luck. Howard Schultz pointed out, a lot of what we as ascribe as luck is not luck at all. It's really seizing the day and accepting responsibility for your future. It's seeing what other people don't see and pursuing wisdom. Uh, maybe one of the most famous quotes of all time on luck was Benjamin Franklin. Okay, I'm a great believer in luck. The harder I work, the more luck I have. And when I think particularly of Steve, it reminded me when he finally won an Oscar, Denzel Washington pointed out, I say luck is when opportunity, luck is when opportunity comes along and you're prepared for it. So we could say it's luck that Steve Wynn decided to go to New Jersey. We could say it's luck that Steve Wynn decided to leave New Jersey. We could say it's luck that Steve Wynn took his company to Macau with an unbelievable bet, uh, you know, but after a series of decisions, you start to wonder, uh, is it luck? Is it really ability? Or is it vision? And, you know, I, I think that is a key in leadership. Why don't you take us back to some of those decisions, Steve? You Where, mentioned, when you mentioned that the eagle, you know, before the end of the decade, the eagle has landed and we got on the moon. Buzzy Aldrin's my neighbor in Sun Valley. I saw him here yesterday. I said, Buzzy, the next time you go to the moon, get off first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Couldn't help myself. Mom. <laughs> Thank you, Janet, for public service and that you're willing to do that, bring all your abilities. Howard, thanks for lending me the money for the Atlantic City, New Jersey, Golden Nugget. He was one of our first guys to do that. The decisions. Um, 
You know, we've been sitting here for the past four days and all kinds of smart people have been sitting up here talking to you. Every once in a while, I, I think I'm going to have to be one of those guys say, I'm not sure. You know, I, things seemed simple to me at the time. That day that I came in on crutches and you were wearing the Madras shirt and the jeans, and I thought you were one of the office boys with Stan Zacks. We were there together. And your cousin It's good. Me. It's good to be an office boy. <laughs> People are, have their defenses. Though. I'd broken my foot running cross country in Sun Valley. I had a cast on my foot and crutches. And, uh, I thought that Atlantic City was as plain as the nose on your face. How could anybody not understand that opportunity? And you asked me to explain it to you, took notes with your yellow legal pad. I think you interrupted me once in 35 minutes for a definition. And at the end you said, it's time that Drexel Burnham do this. And you'll get lace up shoes and repeat this. And, and I thought Atlantic City was simple. The decision was self-explanatory. And frankly speaking, Mike, when we were building uh, the place in Las Vegas in 2000, for $2.75 billion with money that had been lent to us, uh, I wouldn't have done anything to interfere with get, keeping that promise if health rose over, except a concession in China for casinos. I mean, really, the opportunity was the size of Mount Everest in my eyes. So I can't take any credit for being a visionary there. I, you know, the, the biggest decisions that I've ever made in life have seemed very simple to me. When things get complicated, I usually back off. I guess that's like you, I'm sort of an instinct person. And I think that at my best moments with my colleagues, we've been very self-critical. Never to the extent that would paralyze us from making a decision, but never actually believe in our own stuff. I remember from the days of Penn, the dialectic. Th thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I love that scene in Fiddler on the Roof when Tevye says, blah, blah, blah for God. But on the other hand, <laughs> I like that on the other hand. And so, you know, I, I can't take too much credit for the decisions. They've seemed pretty straightforward to me. But you know, Mike, I'd like to add that um, Steve says it, was, it wasn't hard to make that decision. And one of my beliefs is that success is always obvious in retrospect. Mm -hmm. uh, but Steve, when you look at the property where you built uh, your, your, your dream hotel in Las Vegas, the truth is another company owned that property first. And, yep. th and they either, either the potential wasn't as obvious to them or they didn't have the nerve uh, to follow through and they sold it to you and you made a lot out of it. So it's not, it's not always that obvious. Howard, Michael Jackson wanted to meet Siegfried and Roy for the Thriller tour because he wanted to do some illusion to disappear and reappear in these arena shows. And he called up Diana Ross and got me to introduce him to Siegfried and Roy. It was just before the Mirage opened, but it was finished. And Michael asked me to take him on a tour, and I did. And we went back down to the Golden Nugget. The place wasn't quite finished, but it was shaped up. And I got a phone call. He asked me to come down to the suite. He said, I'd like to ask you a favor. No one will ever know about this except you and me, but I'd like to ask you some questions and tape it. And he had a little tape recorder. In the, it was in that chairman's apartment where we did the towels commercial. And he had a tape recorder. And he, I said, okay, sure. It just seemed like an innocent enough request. His first question is, don't you get scared? Of what? I mean... It costs over 600 million and it's so big and it's so complicated. And I said, you know, Michael, by the time we start one of these places, we've had to design it, develop a business plan, convince some of the toughest, smartest financial people in the world to help us finance it. We've been over and over it so many times. We've, we've examined, we've cross-examined, re-cross-examined our premises. By the time we get to breaking ground, we really believe it based upon hard, repeated visitations of our assumptions. You know, I, I remember that question. I still have a little cassette. He gave me a copy of it, Mike. I've still got a, that Michael Jackson cassette. I can go dig it up somewhere. Well, I think the point also that you're saying, Steve, by the time you break ground, you've lived with it for one or two or three years. Almost two years. 
And it's almost like an erector set that you're going to just follow the pieces yeah. that you've thought through. That's a very different scenario than uh, some of the positions I've, I've occupied where you, you okay. don't have that luxury. You've got to make decisions like this, and you've got to know that you will not have complete information. In fact, even as you're deciding, new information is going to be coming in and at you all the time. And what you have to be able to do as the leader is to make the call uh, and understand that that call may change or you may evolve as the information evolves. But the, the notion of having two or three or four years to marshal a battle plan, do what you're going to do, et cetera, that, that is not something that Janet, occurs. what's the most important thing you bring to those moments? I think what you bring uh, to the table is the ability to sift, to prioritize, um, to direct, and to project to folks confidence that and, that, and there, that there will be a that you know we're going to work this. We're well, going to get through this. Janet, we, let's take a look at this quote from uh, <coughs> General George Patton. It is the essence of leadership at difficult times to demonstrate and induce confidence, calm, and courage. <coughs> In many ways, isn't that what you're saying to us? Absent the pearl-handled revolvers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Howard, um, we, had a, uh, a, we had Tony Blair spending the last five days with us here, and here's a quote from one of his panels that I think you can think about as you've led your firm. The art of leadership is saying no, not saying yes. It is very easy to say yes. You might want to think about it in terms of the type of assets you could have bought or, or, or areas that you haven't gone in. You want to talk sure. a little bit about that? Well, I mean, it, it, it's making the hard decisions. and. Uh, an example is that I think that to, you know, don't, since we're all friends here, I'll fill you in on a little secret. In our business, good performance brings more money, and if allowed to go unchecked, more money brings bad performance. And so one of the critical decisions for a moneymaker is to uh, stop the process at some point in time. And the, the most important decisions you make in the marketing area are, are the business you don't take. You know, the people who uh, are hiring you because you had a good year rather than because they believe in what you're doing, in which case you'll never satisfy them. Um, the people who expect you to see the future and uh, expect you to avoid every problem and take advantage of every opportunity. And, uh, and the money that's going to be hot money and stay for a little while and then depart. Uh, so I think that uh, turning down money be it the wrong money or too much money, uh, is an example. Um, and uh, anybody can make the easy decisions. So you can't distinguish yourself by making the easy decisions. It's the hard ones. Uh, and, uh, and when you have to face them uh, you know, on horseback, as you did, Janet, and without preparation, without um, intricate game planning, I think that's the real mark of leadership. Steve, the issue of Macau. You're somewhat in a unique position compared to many people, Howard, for example, in that whereas Howard is not, his firm holds positions for a period of time. If they don't like him anymore, they have the ability to sell. You make a decision to spend $4 billion building a building in Macau. You cannot move it. So you made a decision for a long period of time that's dependent on future government decisions and other issues. In a sense, many of the decisions you, you make are irreversible in that sense. You could theoretically sell the company or sell the hotel as you did in Atlantic City. But you've, you've made a decision for a long period of time, potentially for decades. How does that weigh upon you as, as you lead the company? I'd says that I'm trying to learn how to speak Mandarin. 
<laughs> it's not easy, <laughs> but I hope over time my Mandarin gets better. And I think <laughs> that, that sort of describes the situation. I hope I'm there for decades. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to remember that I'm a guest, that I'm overwhelmed with gratitude and good fortune that I've been given a chance to participate in that activity, outrageously beneficial though it is. And there's only one thing left to do in my business, and that is the basics better. Gimmicks, razzmatazz, worthless in the long run. The only way to take things to another level, to have a future, to make sure that you can build a franchise is to do the basics better. One single detail at a time. God lives in the details. And so building a hotel for the decade is to make sure that it's perfect for today. Try and look around the corner, think ahead and try and think like a customer. And you know when it gets right down to it. Don't let it get too cold in the room. <laughs> Not funny. <laughs> think like a guest. And just grind on it. That's all I know how to do. I'm, on detail, I'm a junkyard dog. You know what I mean? And I surround myself with friends that don't think that way because I say so. I'm trying, I, I try and affiliate myself with bright people who've come to the same common sense conclusions on their own. So we are a group of like-minded people, checking each other, certainly with different personalities and different takes, but on the basics, we've come to the same conclusions using our own common sense. Common sense, and you know, when Janet talks about the world she lives in and how she had to make these decisions on changing fact patterns, new information, that's one of the reasons why sitting up here I said on the microphone, thank you. That's a tough thing you did, a very difficult thing, especially that job at Homeland Security. Man, oh man, ma'am, you must have had some really weird times with the information that came to you incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I admire you for the success that you had in it, Janet. Thank you, Steve. That's you nice bet. Thank you. Howard, you have the luxury to do a great deal of traveling around the world. Uh, your firm invests internationally. As you look at the world through the eyes of the people in those countries you're at, uh, how does that affect how you make decisions to lead your own firm? And so whether you're in Europe or North Africa or Asia, et cetera, and you spent a, a large part of your life outside the United States, how would you compare and contrast in that situation and how does it affect your leadership at the firm? Well, I think that one of the most important things is to have a, a view on the long term. Uh, I've gone uh, at different points in time uh, to uh, emerging countries, uh, for example, uh, Dubai and uh, my first trip to the Middle East, which was in 05. And uh, what they said is, well, we're not interested in the products you have to sell because we're just going to keep all our money in Dubai because it's going up 50% a year and it always will. And uh, so you have to realize that, uh, you know, uh, maybe that's too, you talked before about the importance of reasonable expectations and, <clears throat> and uh, their, their expectations had not been informed yet by living through a tough time. Now they have been. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really believe uh, in what Mark Twain said, history does not repeat, but it does rhyme. And there are a few underlying themes uh, like cyclicality, uh, regression to the mean, uh, the importance of knowing what you don't know um, and, and, uh, and, and that kind of thing, which are applicable uh, in every market, uh, in every geography. And uh, some people have figured it out already and some people haven't. Whoever put up that slide was prescient about what I was going to say next. But, you know, uh, every once in a while in a, in a certain geography or in a certain time uh, when things are going great, 
people say it's different this time. This time, the trees really can grow to the sky. And as Mark Twain said, you know, they can. And, uh, and people get a harsh reminder. So I think just keeping uh, the universality of these experiences uh, in mind is extremely important. Howard, we've seen a number of firms that have given birth in the financial service industry by people making a decision to leave. In the 1970s, uh, George Roberts, Henry Kravitz, Kohlberg wanted a share of their profits, and the leadership at Bear Stearns said no, so they left and formed another firm. Yes. Uh, as you look back to Howard Marks and Bruce Karsh and your other partners when you were working at Trust Company in the West. If you were the CEO of Trust Company in the West at that time, what would you have done to try to keep this team who eventually left and formed the great firm of Oak Tree today? Well, you know, I, I, I don't want to talk uh, ill, but given the opportunity, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, this is, <laughs> this is a panel on leadership, and the point is that, 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 that leadership, I think, was not stressed there. Uh, TCW was a, a big tent, you know, and, and the, you know, the shoe department at Bloomingdale's is not run by Bloomingdale's, it's a concession. You go in there and you rent space and you do your thing. <clears throat> and I, I think that that company and other other companies that I know of are run under what we learned at Wharton is called Theory X, which is you bring people in, you give them a job, you pay them, and that's it. You get more out of people, as Steve said, if you give them leadership. And, uh, and, and uh, TCW is a loose confederation of profit centers without a central core, without a creed, without uh, something that everybody there uh, believed in and could get behind. And I think that have, that creating that could have made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Of course, as you say, it's also nice to be able to increase your percentage of the profits. Well, I think one of the keys with, with, ev with everything that you're addressing here is the question of what do you stand for? Mm -hmm. What does your company stand for? Because there's yeah. obviously a lot of volatility yeah. in this period of time. And, and so, Janet, when you met with the regents and you met with the chancellors of the various universities, mm -hmm. I'm sure they asked you, what do you stand for and what do you believe in? Mm -hmm. In various ways they asked that question. Um, I, I think it's a, you know, one of the things I, I try to do is when you have a big complicated organization, is try to boil it down to a phrase or two that everybody who's in that organization <coughs> knows and can remember. Uh, and it can be somebody who's working in the cafeteria all the way to a chancellor uh, or the head of a, a, uh, an agency within the department, et cetera. So, and, and that requires you as the leader to kind of sit, <clears throat> take a step back and say, what is it that we do that we want to be the best in the world at? That's our, we want to be the best in the world. Um, and, you know, for the university, I said, we teach for California, and we do a remarkable job on, uh, this is not the place for statistics, but it's an amazing story of accessibility and social mobility, teaching for California, and we research for the world. Uh, we take on big problems, and we have the, we have the, the, the bandwidth to address them and solve them in a cohesive in a way. Teach for California, research for the world, Everybody can get plugged into that. And then, you, and then I think as the leader, you, you've got to be a source of energy. I mean, you're not just saying something. You've got to believe it yourself. And, then, and everything you say and do is meant to be an energy source for those who are working with you in, in the company, uh, in your firm, uh, where, wherever. And so that's you know, what, I, what I try to do as, as I take over a new spot. And that's what I communicated when I was being interviewed for this one. Where'd you go to school? I went to uh, undergrad at Santa Clara University, uh, and I went to law school at the University of Virginia. And didn't you graduate as valedictorian from Santa Clara? Yes, I did. Just, just yes, I that. did. <laughs> Howard went to Wharton. Mike went to Wharton. We, all three of us went to the University of Pennsylvania. I was in English literature 
from the college, and he's quoting Twain. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem but, right. But you know, Mike, I think, I think the common thread that I've heard from Janet and Steve and, and me, and I know you believe it, is that uh, I think probably the most important single element of leadership is enunciating what the company stands for and what everybody should believe. Yeah. What, and what, what everybody we're about. should pull yeah. together behind. Yeah. You can't, and, and as, as a, in, the, in 02, which was a tough time in the stock market, the third year of the first three year decline in the stock market since the depression, uh, a consultant uh, once said to me, you know, uh, you gotta stand for something other than just money. And I think that's extremely important. You know, it's interesting, Jan, when you, when you spoke here, for a few years, I traveled around with General Schwarzkopf. Mm -hmm. And um, we spoke uh, to motivate people, particularly as related to uh, cancer and other issues together. And I noticed the first time we went out, I gave a talk, he gave a talk, and it was a rousing talk. And I, next time we went out, I gave a different talk, and he gave the same talk. Uh, and then the third time we went out, I gave a different talk and he gave the same talk. So, I, you know, we were traveling and said, asked the general, you know, I noticed there's a lot of similarities between your first, <laughs> your second, and, and your third talk. And he said, you know, he's learned, he's got to keep it simple. First, he has to keep it simple for himself, that he's on message. And second, people cannot take that many different thoughts at one time. So if he's delivering the same thing, reinforcing it, he wants people to be able to do things. And I know Eisenhower's, one of his famous quotes on leadership was, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. And so his point was to lead the troops and et cetera. If he said the same thing two or three times in a row, eventually it would be theirs. They would be saying it. I went on and gave a different speech each time I hadn't learned uh, from that standpoint because I wanted to present a different point, but it was a powerful lesson for me to learn uh, from that standpoint. And so I'd like to maybe step back here, uh, Steve, and, and let's start with you on this issue. You not only uh, made the decision to go to New Jersey or made the decision to revamp what the hotel industry was in Mirage or redo it again at Wynn uh, and in Macau and again in Macau here, uh, but you made the decision in some cases almost to bet the company. Okay, so your commitment to your employees and the shareholders that, you know, you uh, are going to make sure they're financially strong. Okay, that's your responsibility, then in good times and bad times. Uh, how much were you willing uh, to make that decision and, quote, bet the company? How confident were you in each one of those that you perceived you actually weren't betting the company, you were creating opportunities for the company? I was very lucky. <laughs> at age 36, 37, 35 or 36 actually, when I met you, one of the things you did at a, at a point in my life when I had not given such matters serious thought, you gave me a little afternoon tutorial when we were alone together somewhere about capital structure, not just being the purview of eye-shade accountants or financial officers, but really the fundamental issue of a CEO, that the capital structure was the thing that protected service levels, employee job security, and everything else. That lesson that came from you to me as we were alone one day about capital structure and its relation to the security and the real in, in, interior power of the enterprise was something that I absorbed and understood more and more as I got older. And so, when it seemed as if we were betting the enterprise, so to speak, I always managed to have in the company or personally a fallback position so that if things didn't go the way they were supposed to, if as most human beings I could be wrong, 
as I have been on occasion, that it wouldn't be the end of the game, that I wouldn't really be playing with the employees' careers or their futures. I, I love the idea of pushing the envelope, of reaching out, but I don't like the idea of being reckless. It doesn't appeal to me. I'm not suited temperamentally to fly without a net. I'm not that kind of person. And so it may have appeared that we're betting the company sometimes, but while I'm, while I'm driving, we won't. Uh, as I said, Mike, in the tough decisions, they seem simple to me because we checked ourselves. And actually, you know, Mike, before you gave me money in the old days to build these various companies, before Howard did, remember Howard, we got drilled and cross-examined. Sure. We had to convince smart people that we weren't flying without a net, that we had our feet on the ground. Oh, sure, it may have been a new application. It may have required some vision to see something. Look, every enterprise in the world exists, every institution in the world exists, like high-yield bonds, because one person decides at one moment in history that it's time for it to exist. And I suppose at those moments, those junctures of, of history, the, the person looks a little strange to a lot of people, but not to that person. And I'm looking at one. <laughs> so I, I guess in a little way, I might have been like you in those moments, Mike. I thought I knew what I was doing. I, I think that, and we all thought you knew what you were doing. I think, Howard, <laughs> to, uh, to go to you, I think, you know, people respond differently under pressure. And for most of the people who might be watching this on the internet or here today, if you put them at the free throw line with two free throws and the team behind by two points at the end of the game and the time has run out, most people would not want to raise their hand and take those shots or make that eight-foot putt, etc. But some people have been trained as Steve that they're in their element and they don't feel pressure in that element. What type of environment have you as a leader tried to create for your firm and your employees so that they feel comfortable in their environment? They, and they're all not calling you on the telephone and saying, hey, Howard, what do you think of this every day? But how do you create an environment that during volatility in markets and when people think the world's coming in the end <clears throat> in 2008 or 2009 that they have the courage to invest or likewise, when the market is very frothy, that they have the courage to say no and not invest. How do you create that environment that they're comfortable in their assignment? That they're well, first of all, you have to make them believe, uh, well, you have to have an environment such that, and you have to make them believe that they don't have to be perfect to succeed. Because they're, I always say we're only human. And um, I don't believe that anybody can get all these decisions right. And the a great investor is someone who has a somewhat better batting average, that's all. Um, uh, and, uh, but they have to believe that there's a, a, a no penalty for trying and occasionally coming up short. In 98, uh, when we had the, the ruble crisis, the Russian default, the Asian crisis, and the, and the meltdown of long-term capital management, one of our smart people came to me and said, you know, I think this is it. I think we're melting down now. I think it's the end of the financial system. <laughs> I said, tell me your problems. He explained, I said, well, I understand why you say that. Uh, it's not illogical. Now go back to your desk and do your job. <laughs> because, because, you know, a, a battlefield hero, uh, not that I equate what we do with them, a battlefield hero is not someone who's unafraid, it's someone who's afraid and does it anyway. And, and that's what we all have to do. And, and I think that leadership is, uh, is, is, is making clear to people that we understand that they're imperfect and they're not going to be invincible. And we know that we're imperfect and not going to be invincible. And we hold you to the same standard of ourselves uh, and not a different one. You know, I know many times, and particularly in the, if you're in the financial service industry and they tell you it's the end of the world, it's always the end of the world. And I remember 1974, stock market went down 50%, interest rates doubled. And we had a person from a major bank who came in and told me this could be the end. Okay, we cannot operate with interest rates at 12%. So 
So I had called a person that worked for Price Waterhouse in Argentina, who they'd be happy if interest rates were 12% just for one month, yeah. let alone for the year, and, and brought him in, and they explained to him how they operate, and I think he felt more comfortable, but it's that perspective, Howard, from that standpoint. Janet, in, in terms of leadership, when you were starting your career, would you, or during your career, was there a moment you'd think back with a person that you stepped back and said, boy, that is a great leader. You were in a meeting one day, and uh, can you recall any particular point in your life where you were not the leader, but someone else was the leader that either led you and the others with their statements that day? Oh, that's a, I'm sure there are, are you know, there are people I think of as very effective leaders, and they were at different places and different times of my life. When I was a small child, it was, you know, the, you know, a leader on a backpacking trip. Um, uh, one time uh, I was with a group and we were riding cross-country horseback, about 200 miles across southwestern uh, uh, southeastern New Mexico, and we were totally lost with these horses in a canyon, and uh, we had gone right, and greater wisdom would have suggested we should have gone left. And so we were uh, really bollocked up, and it was quite a dangerous situation. And I, I still remember the leader of, of the group just, you know, dismounted, we got off, and we walked basically down the face of the canyon with our horses. Everybody got down safely. A um, couple of horses got scared. Uh, a couple of them lost a shoe here or there. But the horses were basically safe as well. But it was that, that sense of calm in the face of the storm that really stuck, stuck with me. And I, I was pretty young then. And uh, that, it was a powerful lesson for me. Well, I want to thank everyone uh, who joined us. And I also want to thank the thousands that joined us from around the world with our goal here to try to change the world, energize you, look for ideas and the leadership from this panel. And in closing, I thought I might read these words. And this is what we were thinking about when we thought about planning this conference three months ago. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters. <laughs> For we today that shares our knowledge shall be our brothers and our sisters. And gentlemen and women around the world shall think themselves accursed that they were not here and hold themselves cheap whilst any speak that join with us upon Global Conference Day. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Very good.